So hi everyone, uh, welcome to the CESG Fishbowl Tele Seminar. Our speaker today is Professor Ashish Goyal from Stanford University, where he is at the Department of Management Science and Engineering, and also by courtesy Computer Science. He received his PhD at Stanford, and after spending a few years at uh, the University of Southern California, he moved back to Stanford, where he is associate professor now. So Ashish's general area of interest is uh, CS theory, econ, games kind of stuff. And he's been very successful at it, uh, and he's received several awards, including the, the NSF Career Award, Herman Faculty Fellowship, and the Rajiv Motwani Mentorship Award. He also is on the advisory board of Twitter. So please welcome Professor Ashish Uh Thanks, Srinivas. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, please feel free to answer questions uh, as I'm going along. And uh, in case I can't hear the question, uh, Srinivas, please just uh, feel free to interrupt me and let me know the question. I can't actually see my WebEx screen. So uh, I, if there's something which pops up on the screen, I, I won't be able to see it. So I'm going to talk about three random walks that surprise. At least they surprise me. The results are quite counterintuitive, at least for me. The first one is joint work with Brahman Brahman and Abhishek. Uh, and this was done uh, starting at Twitter. The second is with Michael Kaplarov and Sanjeev Khanna, and the third, will, the third is with Pranav Dandika, Ian Post, and Ramesh Govindan. If I don't get to the third one, that's fine. I'm going to just discuss the model for the third one, and maybe that's uh, very quickly relevant. So the first one has to do with incremental page rank. So the motivation for incremental page rank is uh, when you go to a site like, for example, when you go to Twitter, you're going to see these things, for example, who to follow, and and many of these are obtained by running some random work based algorithm, something very much like page rank, or at least that's a key algorithm used by these sites. And in fact, the system that you see here was initially prototyped by me using ideas very similar to the ones I'm about to describe. <laughs> so, page rank is an early and famous search rank tool uh, by Bin et al. in 1998, and the premise of page rank is to treat every hyperlink as an endorsement, you are highly reputed if other highly reputed nodes endorse you. And that's inherently a circular definition. And a circular definition leads to a recursive formula naturally. And since this formula let's assume that we are given a network, a directed network with n nodes, m edges, and here V is the set of nodes, E is the set of edges, epsilon is what's known as a teleport probability. DW is the number of outgoing edges from W, and pi W is the page rank. Okay. Now, the page rank of V <coughs> is according to this formula is epsilon over n plus 1 minus epsilon times the sum over all the edges coming into V of the page rank of the originating node of the X pi W divided by the out degree of the node DW. Okay. Now, there's, a, there's an easier way to remember this formula or to interpret this formula or to think about it in a way which helps you derive this formula and that interpretation is, is that a random surfer, <coughs> think of this random surfer as a page rank monkey, this page rank monkey travels to the web graph and it teleports to a random node with probability epsilon at every step, so uniformly random node with probability epsilon and with the remaining probability 1 minus epsilon it follows random hyphenate. And then pi is the stationary distribution of the random walk. And if you think of that as a definition of page length, then this is exactly the formula which computes the stationary distribution. So you can either start with this premise, which is quite interesting. You're highly reputed if other highly reputed notes in and those two. You can start with the formula or you can start with the random walk interpretation, and all three of them lead to the same uh, idea. Now, initially, page length was devised for use in the World Wide Web for search. That's actually more relevant, even more relevant for social networks. So, because if A follows B or A is sent to B, then this implication that A and B B is much more direct, it's really direct. I'm, I'm following you because I like what you say. So, the the underlying model or the, the, the way endorsements flow in a social network is already more aligned with the way page is defined. In social networks, we assume that edges are stored in fast distributed memory as opposed to on disk. Now think of the web search example for a minute, right? In the web search example, 
the web is huge. You're not going to have it in memory, or at least not all of it in memory. Presumably, going to have it on disk. Whereas in a social network, these edges, which are A following B or A being sent to B, they're essential for the day-to-day, -day, minute to minute functioning of social network. If I say something, it has to immediately go to all my friends. So these edges are stored in fast distributed memory. We also assume that we know when an edge changes. So in the web, if a web page decides to change a hyperlink to another web page, the search engine is not immediately going to know. It's only going to know when it goes out and does a back call. In a social network, if A decides to become friends with B, then Facebook or Twitter or whatever social network we are talking about will immediately know that this change happened. And so our goal in this first part of the talk is to maintain page rank efficiently as edges arrive. The two approaches to computing page rank. Again, they correspond to the two interpretations of page rank as we saw before. In the power efficient method, we set the initial estimate of page rank pi zero w to be one over n power mode. So we pretend that the stationary distribution is uniform, and then we run our equations of the following formula. We say pi r plus one v equals epsilon over n plus one minus epsilon times summation over w v in e pi r w divided by dw. And notice this is exactly the formula which defines page rank, exactly the recursive formula which defines page rank, except that on the right hand side we are using the values of the page rank from the RF equation, on the left hand side we are using it to compute values for the R plus 1F equation. Okay. So we use this, we run R iterations of this method and use the final iterate pi R as an estimate of pi, that is known as the power iteration method. The other method is the power, is, is the Monte Carlo method. And here for every node v, we simulate r page rank random walk starting at v, where each random walk terminates upon teleportation. So instead of running the random walk for a long time, whenever you teleport to a random node, you terminate. So let's call these random walks short random walks. We simulate r short random walk starting at node v, we do it for every node v. If node w is within hash w time, then we use hash w times epsilon over r in as an estimate of the page rank. And you can ensure that this is an unbiased estimator. Which makes sense because page rank essentially is the stationary distribution of the random walk. Mm -hmm. In general, this parameter big R, capital R, is something that uh, I'm not going to dwell on too much. But generally, R equals log n suffices for both the power iteration method and the Monte Carlo method. So I, I don't assume that everyone has already seen page rank before, but I'm assuming that some of you have. Does anyone have any questions so far? Question, anyone? So basically in this Monte Carlo method each of your random walks is going to live for some geometric time right uh, because n for exactly 1 over epsilon time right okay and we do r times n of these short random walks right. because we are doing r random walks starting at every node right. the total number of nodes visited in expectation is going to be r n divided by epsilon right. and hence we are normalizing by epsilon over r right. because we, we would like all the pi's to sum up to 1. Right. So I equals order log n suffices for good estimates. The exact bounds differ for the power is just not in the Monte Carlo, but log n is definitely the higher order bound. So now you want to compute incremental page rank, and the goal here, as I alluded to before, is to maintain an accurate estimate of the page rank of every node after every edge arrival. You can do it naively. You can have the power addition by from scratch each time, and the total time over m edge arrivals is order r times m times n. You can have the Monte Carlo method from scratch every time and the total time over m as arrival is then r times m times n divided by epsilon and the 1 over epsilon comes in because of the geometric length of the walk. <coughs> and so many heuristics are known but none is asymptotically a large improvement over the naive approaches and a result is that we can implement Monte Carlo in total time order r n times r times log n over epsilon square under mild assumptions. And if you look at this 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 one time and you compare the two, compare R times M times N divided by epsilon, which is the naive Monte Carlo, and then R Monte Carlo implementation, you see that what's very really happening is we have replaced an M here, which is the number of edges, with a log n over epsilon. And M is typically huge. In a typical social network, M would be several billion, tens of billions, and maybe even uh, up to a hundred billion now. 
for some social network. Whereas login is small and one over epsilon is typically small because epsilon in these examples is typically around 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So it is a big improvement and also as the network becomes dense the time taken to process each edge goes to 0 ok, because the total time is n times r times log n over epsilon square. So, really than graph this would be less than m with the number of edges. So, basically the time you are taking to process each edge is going to 0 uh, and, the, and the mild assumption that we make is the following maybe it is not so mild, but the assumption that we make is the following we assume that the edges of the network are chosen by an adversary. So, we make no assumptions about what the edges in this graph are, but then we assume that these edges are presented to us in random order. So, an adversary chooses the edges and we see to the edges in whichever way to make our job as hard as possible, but then we assume that having been chosen these edges are then presented to us in random order and that is known as the random permutation model. So, at times t equal to 1 2 up to all the way up to m and edge arrives ok because the m edges each of them arrives in at, 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 a, at a different time instance. At any given time the edge that arrives you can think of the edge as being u t comma v t. So, u t is the origin of the edge, v t is the destination of the edge. The out degree of a node w is what we can denote as d t w. Earlier we were calling out degree as this d w, but now because we have many times we, we explicitly put the time as a subscript. So, d t w is the out degree of node w at time t, and phi t of w is the page length of node w at time t. Okay. And a technical consequence of the random permutation model is that the expected value. <coughs> of phi t minus 1 u t divided by d t u t is 1 over t <coughs> and this technical consequence I know it, it does not maybe not does not make that much sense just yet, but we are going to see where it comes in. Okay. So, phi t so u t v t is the edge that arrives at time t, <coughs> so u t is the first node on the edge, phi t minus 1 u t is the page length of that node just before that edge arrived and d t u t is the out degree of that node just after the edge arrived okay. and a technical consequence of the random permutation model is the expected value of this quantity is 1 over okay. and uh, is it clear what the expectation is over the algorithm so far is not random randomized I have not said anything about the algorithm yet. So, the expectation is over the random order the edges are chosen by the adversary, but then they are having random order and this expectation is over all random order. Now, given a single social network say Facebook or Twitter it is impossible to verify this assumption because we are given just one order and it is not clear what it means to determine just looking in one order whether the order is random or not, but we empirically validated the above technical consequence for the Twitter network. So, even though we cannot verify the entire assumption we can at least verify the technical consequence okay. and the technical consequence is all we are going to need. <coughs> so, here is the algorithm the algorithm is basically just Monte Carlo. We store our random walk starting at each node initially ok. At time t for every random walk passing through node u t. So, remember the edge that arrives at time t is the edge u t v t. So, every random walk that passes through node u t we shift it to use the new edge u t v t with probability 1 over d t u t okay. <coughs> And it makes sense a new edge arrives let us say then an edge that goes from u to v. The only random walk that could potentially get affected or that would have been different if this edge had been there from the beginning are those random walks that are passing to node u and each of these would have used a new edge with probably exactly 1 over d u. Okay. So, that is exactly what we do we shift these random walks which are passing to node u t by each random walk we shifted to use a new edge with probability 1 over d t u t. <coughs> the time for each rerouting each time we shift is 1 over epsilon the time to decide whether any walk will get out is out of 1 and the claim is faithfully maintains our random walk after arbitrary edge arrival and that is true because we are doing an exact simulation of Monte Carlo. So, what we are doing is exact Monte Carlo we had exact Monte Carlo at time t minus 1 at time t a new edge arrived and every random walk that could have been different we, we explicitly toss points and decide whether it is going to change or not. So, it faithfully maintains our random walk after arbitrary edge arrival. So, we do not really have to worry about uh, trying to prove that this has good uh, that this is a good estimation method because you already know that this is going to do the same thing as Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo is good. Okay. What we have to worry about is the running time, okay. but before we move on to the running time observe that we need the graph and the random walk 
to be available in fast distributed memory. Now this is a reasonable assumption for social network, but not necessarily for the web graph, <coughs> because for the web graph, it's not clear that the graph can be stored in fast distributed memory. But for social networks, like I pointed out before, you need the graph in fast distributed memory because it's part of the day-to-day -day functionality of the web file. <coughs> So I can I, I think someone is asking a question, but I can't hear the question. So at time t equal to zero, what is R? <coughs> at time t equal, so we we assume here that all the nodes are there from the very beginning, but the edges are arriving. At time t equal to zero, there are no edges. So basically, every random walk just starts at a node and just terminates there. So you're randomly picking the R, R random walks, starting at the node. <coughs> I couldn't understand that sentence either. So if you don't, you don't know the edges at time t equal to zero. So what all, all random walks starting at node u will be just random. So all, all random walks that start at node u just finish at node u. They don't go anywhere. So next time an edge arrives out of node u, the degree of that node will then become one, and then every random walk which is passing through that node will now shift to use a new edge. And of course, you can do it all implicitly. You don't. I said that I assume that all nodes are given to us at the beginning, but they don't have to be. If a new node arrives, you can just at that time pretend to generate the R such random walk for that node. So, to analyze the running time of the scheme, remember the technical consequence of the random permutation model, and the technical consequence is the expected value. Of the page rank of node u t at time t minus one divided by the degree of node u t at time t is one over t. So just focus on the technical consequence. <coughs> now the expected running time at time t is the expected number of random walks rerouted divided by epsilon. Because each time you route a random reroute a random walk, you take time one over epsilon. Because like Tina was said, the length of a random walk is geometric with mean one over epsilon. The expected number of and so this expected number of random walks zero out is the same as the number of random walks via u t because to get zero out a walk has to go through this node u t divided by the out degree of u t because that's the probability with which each of these is zero out. So the number of expected value of the number of random walks that are going through u t is exactly r n over epsilon. This is the normalizing factor if you remember in the Monte Carlo. Times pi t minus one u t. The number of random walks which are going by u t is proportional to the page length of u t at time t minus one, because that's again the definition of a, of a, a page length. <coughs> so the R n over epsilon comes right out, and what's left inside is exactly the term in the technical consequence, and that's one over t. So the time expected running time at time t is R n over epsilon squared times one over p. When we sum this over all p. <coughs> Going from one to n, that's a harmonic, and so the entire summation just becomes log m. So you get order r n times log m over f one square, and here we're ignoring the time taken to actually make the decision whether we read out a random box. Okay. And of course, that decision takes time order order one for every every arriving edge. So once again, what I want to point out the surprise here is that this total running time is actually less than n. The total amount of work you have to do for n edges. Is actually less than n, and so normally you would think that as more and more edges arrive, the problem gets harder and harder. But in fact, as more and more edges arrive, your running time is going to go to zero. <coughs> For example, if you look at r n over epsilon squared divided by t, as t becomes larger and larger, more and more edges arrive, the running time is going to zero. So that's the surprising part. Again, we're not doing anything; we're just Trying to blindly do Monte Carlo, all we are doing each time is that we want to reuse as much of the work we have done before, and we can show that under this technical, under this random permutation model, the running time goes to zero. So this is a strictly non-order uh, representation, right? I mean, even if the decision we make whether to read out for edge or not, uh, even if it is minimal, it should be factoring in order. This should be an order. So I, again, I couldn't hear the question. I'm sorry. So shouldn't there be an order m term here? The that the so should shouldn't there be an order m term here for the for the decision whether to read out a random walk or not? Right. Yeah. 
so the thing is that that you regardless of what else you do you definitely have to go and add the dash to your fast distributed memory regardless of whatever you do for page one right because the fact that the edge gets added you have to record it otherwise the social and the fun function. So we have some other things that when you record that edge you can keep a run you can keep a clock and the clock tells you whether the uh, when that edge arrives the clock tells you whether you have to read out any random work or not. So if you can ignore the time taken to actually see whether the clock has expired or not then this is the only time. <coughs> no, that is a funny way of dealing with orders I mean, uh, yeah I mean in, 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 a, in a way it sounds funny but uh, um, there is a uh, <coughs> there is another way of thinking of this. Uh, so this is mainly motivated so, so there is something that I am sleeping under the rug. So this is motivated by uh, so the assumption here that everything is in fast distributed memory and so that the the hard part here ends up being even though I am formulating is running time the hard part here ends up being not running time but network calls. <coughs> so whatever analysis I did for running time works exactly the same way for network calls. So you can imagine the total amount of network traffic that you are generating is Rn over S n squared over T. Now when you add an edge to this fast distributed memory you have to make one network call and you can configure your network in such a way that wherever that edge is going to get stored this exactly where you store this exponential this this, this uh, uh, random uh, this clock which tells you whether you do something for it or not. So if you are doing if you, if you turn it around and instead of running time you look at the number of network calls which is in fact the more interesting parameter. I just don't want to get into it because it requires me to explain the, the computation model in more detail. Then, then it doesn't sound funny because then you have to make one network call to store the edge anyway, and if that edge is not going to cause any error, no more random, no more network calls get generated. That does that make sense? Yeah, let's let's move on. So I had this we had this technical consequence and uh, <coughs> um, we never actually proved it and so I am going to also skip the proof it just it is uh, it is here I can send the slides out and if someone wants to look at the proof uh, it is uh, not that hard. <coughs> so there is some open problems uh, to extend the running time result to adversarial arrival and uh, in fact, we show that you you can't extend the this running time isn't adversarial arrival. You can't get this uh, uh, R n uh, log n over epsilon square dependent if the arrival order is also adversarial. But it's possible that we can have adversarial arrival, but it, maybe we can do better than the naive uh, approach of uh, n times n. <coughs> can we do efficient personalized search? Can we combine inverted indexes with personalized reputation system? And then can we speed up incremental computation of other graph and IR measures assuming the random population model. Uh, are there any questions about this part? I think we are good. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So one observation is this can be implemented efficiently using screen in map reduce, which is also potentially very useful for a host of other problems. So screaming map reduce itself is a nice idea, which is potentially useful for other problems. <coughs> the second random walk based problem is matching some regular bipedal graph. So let's assume that we are given g equals p comma q comma e, and here the size of p equals the size of q equals n. And you can think of P and Q as two parts of a graph of the same graph, and the number of edges in the graph is n. So the n nodes on each side of the graph, it's a bipedal graph. All the edges go from the left to the right, and this graph is such a graph is called D-regular. If the degree of every vertex is equal to D, so the number of edges m equals n times D. <laughs> a subset m of the edges uh, is said to be a matching. If no, no two edges in M share an endpoint, and M is a perfect matching, if M is a matching and the size of M equals N, so M is a perfect matching, if 
uh, node two edges in M share an endpoint in the size of M equals N. So every node is part of some edge in M. Okay. And then we are thinking about this intuitively is to think of the nodes in P as being men, the nodes in Q as being women. We give an N men and N women. Okay. Every man is compatible with D women and vice versa. <coughs> and a perfect matching is a way of marrying of these men and women so that every man is married to exactly one woman, every woman is married to exactly one man. And uh, um, yeah, and then that's that's it. So there's an easy application of something called Hall's theorem, which I'm not going to get into, which shows that every B regular bipartite graph has a perfect matching. So here's an example. This is a D, this is a D regular bipartite graph. It's in fact a four regular bipartite graph, and it has a clear perfect matching. Okay. The perfect matching is the one which I've shown in blue. <coughs> the nodes on the left are matched with the nodes on the right. But the interesting thing about a regular bipartite graph is that if I remove this matching, I'm left with the regular bipartite graph of now degree b minus one or three in this case. And then by in the same theorem, there's going to be a perfect matching in this graph. And so if I remove that matching, I'll be left with the regular bipartite graph of degree two or d minus two. And uh, repeating that, what that shows us that every regular bipartite graph can be decomposed of degree d can be decomposed into exactly d perfect matter. Mm -hmm. So bipartite regular graphs have been studied extensively in the context of expanded constructions, routing, scheduling, class assignments, etc. And they also have connections to this problem also has connections to edge of bipartite multigraphs and also to the Birkhoff binomial decomposition of W stochastic matrices. So W stochastic matrices are the continuous analog of regular bipartite graphs. And so the Birkhoff binomial decomposition of these stochastic matrices is essentially the same, the continuous analog of taking a regular uh, bipartite graph and decomposing the perfect matching. So in 1916, Koenig gave an algorithmic proof of existence of perfect matchings in regular graphs, in regular bipartite graphs, <laughs> and his algorithm is now known to run in order and in time. In 1974, Hopcroft and Carl gave uh, an m square root n time algorithm for maximum matchings or perfect matchings in general bipartite graphs. And in 1982, Gabo and Kareem gave an algorithm which takes order n time when b is the power of 2. Okay. And this works by repeatedly finding order to us and does not mean government in part. <coughs> there have been improvements over the last 20 years by Cole and Hopcock in 1982, Shiva in 1999. And ultimately, by Cole, Austin, Shira in 2000. And in 2000, Cole, Austin, Shira proved the order m running time for finding a perfect matching in regular bipartite graph for general d, not for d of d of power of 2. Okay. So, this d is a power of 2 was not just a technicality, it took 18 years to go from d being a power of 2 to general d. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I'm, I must be confused. So, you just mentioned that uh, every d regular graph has a perfect matching. So, what are these algorithms for? For finding a perfect matching. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. So just like, for example, for the Birkhoff binomial, uh, for, for W stochastic matrices, we know that a Birkhoff binomial decomposition exists, which means that uh, uh, it can be written as a, as a, as a convex combination of formulation matrices. But still, finding one such formulation matrix is still a hard problem. I see. Thank you. Or it's still not hard in the sense of NP hard, but hard in the sense of required computation. So if you're given any algorithm for finding maximum matching in a general graph, you can use it to find a maximum matching in a regular bipartite graph and it'll give you a perfect matching because of false theorem. <coughs> so on the face of it, this sounds like about the best you can do. Right? You're getting order and time, and here uh, m is the number of edges. So basically, you have an algorithm which is linear in your input size because uh, uh, you you cannot uh, uh, if you if you have any algorithm which has to read this graph say from disk into memory, then just reading the reading the graph from disk to memory will take time order n, and so it seems on the face of it, it seems like order n is about optimum. But surprisingly, we can actually obtain sublinear algorithm, and again the final algorithm is going to be based on random walks and it's going to be it's going to be simple and it's quite surprising that you can. Essentially, do it uh, faster than uh, the input size. <coughs> so, you know, assume that the graph is already given to us because, like I said before, if we have to read the graph, then there is no way we get a sublinear algorithm. 
we assume that the graph is given to us in adjacency array format and the question is can we take a random sample of the graph <coughs> so that perfect matching is preserved with high probability and then on how up to okay. so that is one potential direction for getting sub linear algorithm and in a series of results we showed that we can do that we can take a uniform sample from a regular bipedal graph so that with the <coughs> Essentially, n to the power 1.75 uh, with essentially n to the power 1.25 edges, and then in the algorithm of Hopkins, you can n to the power 1.75 times. You can do a little bit better, but please don't uh, get uh, uh, bogged down. I, I don't want to sort of uh, inundate people with these uh, these two results: the uniform sampling result and the non-uniform sampling result. What I want to focus on instead is the lower bound, <coughs> and the lower bound. Says that what we've been able to show that the running time of n. So also ignore the tilde. The running time, which is the min of n d comma n squared over d, is optimal in the class of algorithm with first two sampling and then the Hopkins class. Okay. So any algorithm which relies primarily on first sampling from the given graph and then running Hopkins class can get time which is only minimum of n d comma n squared over d. And that minimum is achieved uh, as a function of n. Uh, that tells us that uh, we cannot get better than n to the power one point five as well. And so the question then is, can we somehow use random walks or some other form of randomization to beat this? <coughs> and our main result <coughs> is that there exists a sub a randomized algorithm for finding a perfect matching <coughs> in a deregular bipedal graph. G equals P from QE and given it excuse me given in adjacency array representation that takes order n log n time both in expectation and with high probability and once again notice that this is much better than time order m because we can have a very dense graph D could be very large but this algorithm will take time only n log n. and surprising this algorithm is actually simpler not only is it more efficient than all known algorithms before it is actually also simpler. So this algorithm will use augmenting paths to repeatedly increase the size of the constructed matching and augmenting path with respect to a partial matching M it starts with an unmatched vertex in P and then alternates between taking unmatched and matched edges until it reaches an unmatched vertex in Q. And so, natural randomization is to take a uniformly random unmatched edge at each odd step. So, at every odd step in this augmenting path, you are going from you you are following an unmatched edge. Okay. So, you have a choice because this path alternates between unmatched and matched edges. In every odd step, you are taking an unmatched edge. So, you might have a choice because there might be many unmatched edges going out of a node. You just use one uniformly at random. And uh, this is what we call an alternative random walk. Okay. So here's an example. We're given the same graph PQ. We're given a partial matching M, which I've outlined here in blue. And let's start with an unmatched node in P. We're going to pick this unmatched node uniformly at random. We're going to pick an outgoing edge from here uniformly at random. The next edge on an augmenting path has to be matched. So we we have to go to this match node. Then we pick an outgoing unmatched edge from this new node. This new node, which is currently marked as a square, uniformly at random. That's we end up going here. We don't really have any choice. We have to go to the matched edge because in every even step we are following a matched edge. Then we follow an unmatched edge. Maybe just by random chance, we ended up revisiting a node. In which case we just keep going. <coughs> so we uh, uh, again have to follow the matched uh, edge. Then we follow another unmatched edge, and this time we end up going to an unmatched node. And as soon as we go to an unmatched node on the right, we have found our augmenting path. We remove the cycle that we had found. This ends up being an augmenting path. Along the augmenting path, we switch the unmatched and the matched edges. So the red edges become blue, and the blue edge becomes red. Blue edge becomes gray, and that's going to increase the size of the matching, the partial matching by one. So here's the algorithm. We define n zero equal to p, our m is our partial matching, and if there's nothing bad. 
in fact every k equals 1 going all the way up to n we run the alternating random walk with respect to n k minus 1 the, the matching for the previous uh, the partial matching of the previous step till we hit an unmatched vertex in q and then we augment along the path of from walk and then n k to the new matching. So every time the size of the matching goes up by one. So by the time we get to M, we we'll have a certain matching. So the algorithm is very simple. Does, does the algorithm make sense? Are there any questions? Sorry, yeah, I didn't quite get that very last step. So you find your unmatched vertex in Q, and then what happens? <coughs> so then you augment. So for example, right now if you look uh, at this augmenting path, this is the augmenting path. We start at this unmatched node in P. Uh -huh. We have an augmenting path, so we have this unmatched edge and a matched edge and unmatched edge. We strip these edges, so every the unmatched edges on this uh, augmenting path become matching edges, right. and the matching edge oh, on this augmenting path becomes a non-matching edge. Thanks. But because the path was of odd length, we have one more edge now in our matching than we had before, right. yeah. and so we have augmented the matching by one. And if we do this augmentation n time, then you're going to end up with a perfect matching. So on the face of it, this sounds like a very complicated process, right? It seems unlikely that this is going to give time and log n because we're doing something n time. But it turns out it does. And the theorem is that this algorithm finds a perfect matching in time and log n. And here's a here's an analysis of the algorithm. Right? So. <coughs> It's a the analysis is simple enough that I feel like I can reasonably finish it or at least the high level ideas in uh, 10 minutes. So let me try to do it. So I'm saying G is a given as uh, a given deregular bipedal graph, and let M be a partial matching that leaves 2k nodes unmatched. Okay. So now M leaves 2k nodes unmatched, k on the left, k on the right. Okay. Then we're going to define the matching graph x equals h of g comma n. It's a it's a new matching graph as follows and note that this graph as I am defining now this graph is only being defined for the purpose of the analysis okay. uh, the algorithm I already described is thing so we are given G we are given M which is marked by these blue edges to get H we first orient the edges of G from P to Q so every edge goes from P to Q from left to right okay. then we connect we find an artificial source S and an artificial thing T, and we connect them with D edges to unmatched nodes. So this is the artificial source S, an artificial thing T, and S is connected to each of these unmatched nodes. These green nodes are unmatched. But notice that this edge is thick, and by this thick edge, what I'm meaning is that it's not just one edge. S is connected to this unmatched node with D parallel edges, and with so this unmatched node with D parallel edges, and here again with D parallel edges. And similarly, every unmatched node on the right is connected to T with D parallel edges. So hence, hence these edges are drawn in things. I then contract every pair U comma V which was already in the matching. Like for example, this node and this node is already in the matching into a super node. So the algorithm can now be replaced as follows: <coughs> M zero equal to C for each k equal to 1 to n we run the simple random walk from s in the matching graph until it hits t. So from s the thing is if we if we start at s and we hit t then that is the same as starting at a uniformly random node uniformly random unmatched node in p and ending at a uniformly random unmatched node in q. So we run a simple random walk from S in the matching graph until it hits T, and we augment along the path obtained from the walk. And again, remember that this is this restatement is only for the purpose of the analysis. The algorithm, as you can implement it, is already fixed. So here's the following lemma: the, the main lemma that we prove is that uh, uh, if we have uh, if we are given G as a D regular bipedal graph and M is a matching that means K not unmatched. Right, that should have been 2k k on the left and k on the right and let edge be the matching graph then the expected time until the simple random walk starting from s t that moves one plus n over k okay. and the reason that is going to be useful is because if we sum it up again we are going to have a harmonic of 1 over k and that is going to become problem. 
So the, so the proof of the main lemma. Remember that we had already identified u and v. We now also identify s and t in the mapping graph. Okay. So we put s and t together, and we call them just s. So all that is going out of s are going out of s. All that is that are coming into t are also not coming into. The resulting graph h star g comma n k is a balanced vector graph. What does that mean? So let's look at the node s. The k unmatched nodes in P, k unmatched nodes in Q, so that d times k edge is going out of s, and d times k edge is coming into s. Look at any unmatched node that d edge is coming into this unmatched node from the node s, and that d edge is going out because the degree is. Look at any of these blue super nodes that d minus one edge is coming in, and that d edge is going that d edge is going out. Okay. Sorry, d minus one edge is going out. Because one of the edges inside the super node got uh, uh, compressed. So the resulting graph h star g comma n k is a balanced directed graph. Okay. And any balanced directed graph. Uh, so I'm just this, this just illustrates how uh, a super node is is balanced. This illustrates how an unmatched node is balanced. And this uh, so in any balanced directed graph, the stationary distribution of the simple random walk is just proportional to the out degree of a node. So this is, so <coughs> this is just an elementary exercise. You take any any directed graph which is balanced, the in degree is the same as the out degree, and you do a simple random walk. The stationary distribution is going to be proportional to the out degree. So, but the heading time is proportional to one over the stationary distribution of a node. The heading time from S to T in H of G and K. Is the return time to s in h star because we identify s and t together, and the return time is going to be proportional to one over the uh, stationary distribution of s. So all we have to do is to plug in the out degree of s here and and do the summation of the out degree and we are done. And we can essentially do that summation one over pi s is uh, the summation of the out degree of every node j. Divided by the out degree of node uh, s, and the out degree of node s is dk. And when we do the summation, it's uh, basic arithmetic, and we get to one over one. We get to one plus n over k. And if we were to sum uh, one plus n over k, the expected running time ends up being just uh, n times one plus h n, where h n is the harmonic n is harmonic number, which is order n log n. Now this. We can also this is in expectation. We can also obtain a high probability result by truncation of random walks, which are taking much more time than what we are expecting them to. Okay. Uh, uh, are there any questions about this algorithm? I, I have a quick question, maybe. Yeah. Uh, what if it's not fully connected? What if you have, uh, the graph is not fully connected? How, do you need to know a, a priori which set to because you, then you'll need to launch different random walks. Is that correct? Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, not not really. Because um, let's go back to the algorithm, right? So we are, we are going to do the first part is to pick uh, a uniformly random unmatched node, and if you have disjoint components, then there's some probability you'll pick one from one component. There's some probability that you'll pick one from another component. And uh, everything will continue to work out. If you if, if there is a node that you pick as a first node in your random walk ends up being in component A, then you will find an augmenting path in component A. If it ends up being in component B, then you will end up finding a, a path in component B. Thank you. Yeah. So we're not assuming that the graph is uh, connected. <coughs> so. In fact, uh, we can also show some strong lower bounds. So we show that the randomization is necessary. Right? So any deterministic algorithm necessarily takes omega n times d time. So we got n log n, and any deterministic algorithm must take time n d. And any randomized algorithm that succeeds with high probability must take time omega n log n. And so we sort of found things which are we found a case where the randomized algorithm is about does about as well as any randomized algorithm can do, and much better than any deterministic algorithm can do. And the question is why they're surprising. So why surprising is 
the following say imagine the following uh, imagine the following uh, process so instead of having men on the left and women on the right imagine we just had women okay. and we are just reaching into this pool of n women and pulling out one at random okay. and when we pull one out we replace uh, we put it back okay. and we keep repeating this process the sampling with replacement till we have sampled every woman at least once okay. that process takes time and log in so a random walk essentially in, in a random walk each time we had an unmatched man on the left we are picking a random woman on the right but we are picking only one of the friends of this, this man this man right so in our problem there is a lot of combinatorial uh, uh, lot of combinatorial constraint but even if we were picking women with completely with disregard to men without worrying about who they are matched to it still takes us a long time by sampling so somehow it is surprising that a random walk which is uh, doing a very structured random walk which is very really depends on the structure of the graph takes the same time as just sampling with replacement and that problem of sampling with replacement is known as the Kuban collector problem. <laughs> so the next thing I want to talk about is liquidity and credit networks I am going to define what credit networks are define my liquidity model and analysis and uh, uh, compared to centralized payment infrastructure, I am going to start out by giving a very brief overview of uh, what we call the reputation system. And here, we are get the setting is that we are given a population of individuals and objects. So, am I am I already out of time? No, you have got plenty of time. No problem. Okay. <coughs> So we are given a population of individuals and objects. We are also given some sort of reviews and rating. And the goal is to compute the global reputation for each node as reflected by the possibly inconsistent review. And this turns out to be subject to manipulation and presentation bias. <coughs> At the same time, it's central problem in person network because uh, there are large number of content generators, for example, tweets, blogs, YouTube videos, with an increasing person's presence of small merchants on eBay, Etsy, Craigslist, Red Beacon, the large number of first time transactions and there is some very nice exclusive articles which have been written on this. <coughs> so <coughs> we are going to sort of try to because these reputation systems are subject to manipulation and presentation bias and they also have spammy uh, possibilities we are going to focus on one particular way of doing reputation systems which is what we call a credit network. And this is a decentralized, a credit network is a decentralized payment infrastructure introduced by Defi and Bar in 2005 and then reintroduced by Goshitol in 2007. Here we do not need banks and common currency and it is supposed to model its trust in network interaction. You can think of this as a robust separation system for transaction oriented social network. I am not going to focus so much on how this system is used, I am going to focus more on what it has to do with random walks and why this random walk is applied. Uh, another way before I give the system before I describe the system I want to sort of set some more context uh, and the context is the difference between barter and currency. So barter was what people were using before they had currency in barter if I need a good from you I would better have exactly the blanket that you are looking for and that is barter I exchange something that I have and do not need for something that you do not need but have that I want. But this is a very hard thing to do to find exactly the right match and so barter has low liquidity and to combat that very early on in civilization uh, we decided to have currency and currently we have centralized banks which issue currency and modern currencies are all essentially IOU from the bank they are essentially like a like a like a, uh, a bill of debt from the bank. In fact, some currencies explicitly say that if you look at the British pound, it explicitly says that the the British exchequer owes the holder of the bearer five pounds or ten pounds or so on. Okay. And these uh, centralized currencies, they give very high liquidity. You can trade with any stranger. You can go buy coffee, you get a drink, whatever you want. Right? And all strangers to trade freely. And so, trade networks are somehow between the two. It's a bilateral exchange of IOUs among friends. So here's an illustration. So imagine that these two comic characters, the small one on the left is Asterix, the bigger dude on the right is Obelix and Asterix says Obelix I trust you for 10 IVs 
and what that means is Atlas is willing to accept up to 10 dollars from Obelix without any collateral and these are going to be Obelix dollars so Obelix is going to print them sign them they are not going to be signed by the Federal Reserve they will just be signed by Obelix and Asterix says that I is willing to accept with 10 of these okay. Asterix uh, uh, can also print his own currency and Obelix is Asterix that plus you for 90 IOUs. Okay. So let us say Obelix then needs 10 IOUs worth of stuff from Asterix. So Obelix pays, prints 10 uh, Obelix dollars gives them to Asterix okay. and in return Asterix does uh, Obelix some favor. So now to just get a quick poll how much more should Asterix test Obelix for? Sorry what was the question again did not quite hear. So Asterix tested Obelix for 10 IOU and then Obelix gave Asterix 10 IOU how much more should Asterix test Obelix for? Uh, I guess right. it's a trick question. The answer is zero because S six is for ten, and you already now have ten IOUs for Mobilix. All oh right, yeah, sorry. Yes. And so next time S six needs something for Mobilix, what should you do? So next time S six needs something for Mobilix, S six should first give Mobilix Mobilix's yeah. own currency back. Right. So that essentially means that S six can first give Mobilix and Mobilix dollars, and then Mobilix will sell just S six for ninety. That is essentially the same as saying that is essentially as if the trust between Asterix from Asterix to Obelix disappears because Asterix already holds 10 IV from Obelix and Obelix now trusts Asterix for 100 as opposed to 90. Okay. So, from 1090 we went to 0 100 and what we can show is that instead of remembering that Obelix gave 10 IVs to Asterix it is completely equivalent to just remember these new trust values. And for those of you who have seen uh, flow networks before, this is equivalent to doing an augmentation of 10 units in a flow network from Asterix to Obelix. Because when you do an augmentation of flow network, capacity decreases in the forward direction, they increase in the reverse direction. If you haven't seen flow networks before, do not worry about it because it is not going to matter. Now, the same thing can be done at a distance. So, imagine there are these four people and there is no trust between uh, the left edge and the right edge then they can transact via the middle okay. So, in this case the blacksmith gives a blacksmith IU to Asterix, Asterix gives an Asterix IU to Obelix, Obelix gives an Obelix IU to Capricornix who is this musician here and the musician will do some favor for this blacksmith okay. And as before the trust values in the forward direction in the direction of the IU is flowing and the trust values will increase in the reverse direction will decrease. And this again, once again, this is exactly equivalent to doing an augmentation in a flow network. And once again, if you if you haven't seen augmentation in flow network before, don't worry about it because it's not going to be important for this talk. It's just an observation. So does the model make sense? Are there any questions about the model? They, people can keep doing these transactions repeatedly, and if there's no path, if there's no trust path from the person who wants to buy something to the person who needs to sell it, then the transaction will fail. So you require essentially bilateral trades in each of these, right? You require that uh, you know Asterix and uh, the guy with the hammer. Uh, he they, they need to have some uh, some way of exchanging at some point. So if it's just one-sided, it won't work. Like <coughs> say, you have to basically assume that the network is balanced in the sense the data which I need something, the data which I have to do something. Okay. Right. And so if if there if there's some nodes in the network we just keep consuming, they'll go bankrupt. Right. If there's some nodes in the network who keep producing but never need anything, then they essentially get to the point where everyone has asked them for favors and they, they do not trust anyone anymore because they have done a lot of favors to everyone and they just sit on they, they have these IUs from all these people they just sitting on. Mm -hmm. So, somehow, but that is not a problem that a currency system can cause, right. So, currency system can just facilitate uh, transactions. If in general there is a node which is always consuming or a node which is always producing then the system no matter what currency you, you use you are going to get into problems. So, in a credit network we assume that we are given a graph G equal to V comma E uh, it could be a social network appear to be a network the nodes are non rational agents or players 
or human beings by non national i mean that they 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 just following this protocol uh, defined they're not trying to sort of game the system they spend their own currency and there is edges an edge has a credit limit cuv and as from utb and the credit limit cuv is bigger than zero extended by nodes to each other and payments are made by passing ious along a chain of trust and that's the same as the augmentation of single commodity flow along the chain like i mentioned before and credit gets a penalty when payments are made in the other direction if there are no payments in the other direction if you are always consuming then people go bankrupt and so this is the following very interesting robustness property which i'm not going to dwell on because i want to focus on liquidity but the robustness property is that every node is vulnerable to default only from its own neighbors and only for the amount it directly trusts them for So some research questions here are liquidity can credit network sustain transactions for a long time or does every node quickly get isolated that's one question another question is network formation how do national agents decide how much trust to assign to each other i'm going to focus today only on the liquidity question <coughs> and to answer this question of liquidity we have to have a model and so in this model we're going to assume that the edges in the network have integer capacity c bigger than zero summing up both direction so we sum up the Start from Obelix to Aspects and Aspects to Obelix and call that C. This is transition rate matrix lambda, which is n cross n, and uh, lambda U V is uh, the rate at which U wants something from V. Okay. And so we repeat these transitions and every time that we choose S from a T with probability lambda S T, just the way we choose it for rate matrices or rival matrices in network traffic. And then we try to route a unit payment from S to T by the shortest feasible path. We update edge capacities along the path. If no such path exists, then the transaction fails. So does this model make sense? Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, if if a lot of transactions fail, then we have low liquidity. If if almost all transactions succeed, then we have high liquidity. Should I keep going, Shiva? Yes, please. So this this seems like a hard thing to analyze, but it turns out to be it turns out to be doable, which is the surprising part. So now let S and S prime be two states of the network, as I've shown here. Right? S is the one on the left. Let's say S prime is the one on the right. And a state of the network now is a complicated thing. A state of the network is uh, for every edge, say for edge for any edge between uh, any two nodes, U and Y. You need to know how much credit is going in one direction versus the opposite direction. So C, which is the which is so the sum of the credits on both edges is fixed. The edge from U to V and the edge from V to U, if we sum it up, that that value is fixed. But how is the portion between the edge from U to V and V to U is part of the state of the network? Okay. So the state of the network is not a node in the graph. The state of the network is the whole graph along with the the capacity on every edge. Okay. So the state space is going to be huge. Given two states, we say the S prime is cycle readable from S if the network can be transformed from S to S prime by routing a sequence of payments along feasible cycles. So in this case, <coughs> imagine we send a send a payment from U to Y to W to V back to U. <coughs> Then, like I said before, when you send payments, and uh, this the the forward capacity is going to decrease by one, the reverse capacity is going to increase by one, and this is going to give us this new network S prime. <coughs> But we got some S to S prime by sending flow along the cycle, so we say that S and S prime are cycle readable. And this notion of uh, cycle readability is useful in the following sense: Let S one T one, S two T two, S three T T be the set of transactions <coughs> that succeed when payment is routed along the shortest feasible path from S to T. Remember earlier I said that whenever possible, you always send the send the payment along the shortest path. Then the same self transition succeeds when the payment is routed along any feasible path. So it doesn't really matter that we use the shortest path. It doesn't matter which path we use. The self transition that succeeds or the liquidity of the network is exactly the same. And that's that's what we call path independence. And the proof sketch is that sending a unit of flow along two different paths from the same source to the same destination leads to two states in a cycle reachable. <coughs> But once if two cycles are reachable, then anything that succeeds in one will succeed in the other because we can first send flow along cycles 
and then send the flow that we want to send. Are there any questions about this? Should I keep going? Sure. So, cycle reachability partitions all possible states of the credit network into equivalence classes, and and this allows us to prove the following theorem. Okay. So, so basically, once you partition things into equivalence classes, what really happens is you can think of these transactions as happening not from state to state, but from equivalence class to equivalence class. If the transition rates are symmetric, for example, if lambda u b equal to lambda v u, then the network has a state uniform steady state distribution over all reachable equivalence classes. <coughs> and this is quite surprising because the initial Markov chain that we had defined we had defined was very complex. The random walk, the initial random walk we had defined was very complex. You have these states in the graph, and you're moving from state to state. And uh, it's not true that your uh, steady state distribution is uniform over all states. <coughs> Whereas, if you instead think of equivalence classes, then it does turn out the steady state distribution is uniform over all equivalence classes. And the consequence we see is the complete characterization of success probability in three cycles of complete graph, and we have good estimate for adsorption in graph. And the reason is, <coughs> even though we have a complex class of chain, now we have reduced everything to just counting equivalence classes. To estimate a failure probability, we count the number of equivalence classes in which the combination is going to fail, we count the number of equivalence classes in which it is going to succeed, and that gives us the success probability. So, here is an example for two node network. We assume that the capacity is C between these two nodes, then we have C plus one state, maybe all the capacity goes in one direction, all of it goes in the other direction, or partition somehow. Each of these states ends up being a different equivalence class. So, success probability for a transaction is C over C plus 1. The only way you can't go from U to V is if all the capacity is going from V to U. You can do the same thing for cycles, <coughs> you can do the same thing for trees, and I should uh, I should sort of I should skip uh, because I think I'm running out of time. But there, there's more we can prove. So, assume capacity is C equal to 1 on each edge, and the Markov chain is ergodic, and again. The Markov chain being ergodic is a very very minor assumption. Any any transition matrix whose support forms a connected graph will result in an ergodic Markov chain. Let D be you know the degree of node V in this graph, and by degree I mean uh, the number of uh, edges incident. Then the stationary probability that V goes bankrupt is at most one over one to V. This we can also analyze bankruptcy probability, and bankruptcy probability essentially means that nobody in the graph does you. So all the edges in the graph are orienting oriented away from you. We can define an equivalent centralized payment infrastructure. Let's say, for example, we take this node, <coughs> let's say asterisk, and currently there's 107 unit of trust coming into asterisk, seven from this musician, 100 from Mobilis. We make all 107 of this come from a centralized entity like the Federal Reserve, <coughs> and we pretend that the Federal Reserve is trusted up to infinity by every participant. And if we think about it for a few minutes, this is actually an accurate model of how the current US dollar works or how the current centralized payment. Uh, infrastructure works. <coughs> so earlier, seven units of trust in the assets was coming from this node, and it was coming from here. We forget all that, and make all hundred seven come from a centralized entity. And so it's a very hard model to compare again. But what we've been able to show is that the bankruptcy probability in general graph is the same in the centralized system as in a credit network. <coughs> So the bankruptcy probability in a credit network, like I said, was one over dv plus one for any node. For a centralized system, is one over the average dv. Okay. And if you look at individual transaction failure probability, that is the bankruptcy probability for a large class of networks, for complete graphs, uh, in simulations, and also some theorems in uh, Bernoulli random graph, in person attachment graph, it turns out the failure probability is the same as in a centralized system as in a credit network. <coughs> And so, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the is the failure probability which is about the same. Okay. So, success probability being within a constant factor would not be a very strong result because that it, it could be the centralized system has 99 percent success probability and the credit network is 49 percent. But here, the, the constant factors are on the failure probability. So, the centralized system fails with probably 0.1 percent, the credit network will fall will fail with probably say 0.2 percent. Question? Yeah. 
the top result seems to show the credit network bankruptcy probability can be lower than centralized system. Right? Yes, so the credit network is uh, node by node. Right. So if you assume all the nodes have the same degree, that probability is lower than what you have on centralized system. Uh, no, so I think this might also be so here I made this approximately one over D average. I think here also is one plus one yeah. I think here also is one over one plus D average. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so uh if you put the exact number in, then in fact the difference you get is between the arithmetic mean and the harmonic mean. And so if you take the average over all nodes in the credit network <coughs> You're going to get the uh, you're going to get one over the you're going to get the one over the harmonic mean, and so somehow uh, that shows that on an average centralized system will do at least as well as the credit network. So some open problems are have to do with the effect of node failures on liquidity and how it varies with network topology. The effect of non-zero payment routing fees on liquidity. <coughs> Uh, so what if when I'm sending uh, payment from node A to node C via node B, maybe node B wants a commission. <coughs> but if node B wants a commission, then a node in our path independence probably does not hold, and all our theorems collapse. Rationality: How do nodes initialize and update these such values? I thought of these nodes as being non-rational, so these credit values were given exogenously. You don't endogenize these. How do nodes decide what values to assign to each other in terms of trust? And the US dollar is more or less anonymous, <coughs> is largely anonymous. But our currency can't be anonymous because there has to be some social network which is actually computing these paths from uh, node view to node view. And so there's some way to make this currency more anonymous. In, in in general, to summarize, in each three, in each three of these cases, the random walk is very simple. In the first case, we are just doing Monte Carlo, in the second case, we are doing the simplest possible augmenting path. In the third case, we are just following this Markov chain, but in each of these three cases, it ended up having a property which ended up surprising us. <coughs> um, and so, I guess that's the, that's the theme of the talk. Thank you.